Okay, this is Pops, X Men ninety seven, episode three. I'm making myself talk about it. Let's do it. All right, X Men 97 got off to a good start with episode one and two. Had my list of grievances. You can see the link in the description for the video thereof. However, episode three, which picks up right after this moment, this is where we left off, right? The another Jean Grey staggers through the door after the birth of the baby Nathan and Morph. This is the version of Morph in this new version. And oh, wow, we have another Jean. What's going on here? And that's what this episode's going to kind of dive into. My problem with this episode, I'm going to sum it up this way and say they try to do way too much in this episode. And I'm going to be a bit of a nitpicker on this one because Inferno is this big, massive story in the comics. It's a lot of things going on. This is early Mr. Sinister in the comic book lore. So they crammed so much in. There's too many elements in this episode, in my opinion. And that's why it doesn't work for me. It seems like it's uh, not edited right. The pacing's all off, things like that. So. You end up with this sort of like version of Gene that they're, they've are they analyzed and they're figuring out isn't really Gene. They're experimenting and they're figuring out like who is she really, what's going on. And basically Beast does this experimentation and basically says, oh, this is the real Gene. We got fake Gene. So we have clone Gene. So long story short, we have fake Gene. I, I have to admit that I'm not a massive fan of uncanny x-men for this part because it just like i said it, it was complicated it's kind of convoluted it's still better than almost anything done in the last few years but at the time it was almost too complicated and it was hard to get into like if you were not into the x-men and love these characters at that point um, and again things are very out of order right compared to the comic books and they're just trying to squeeze all that together i think that the idea of mr sinister creating and continuing to manipulate the situation when Gene and Scott's lives, trying to get the, his hands on the baby, is it interesting. And then it creates this clone who ultimately will become Madeline Pryor. So that's kind of where you end up. You end up with this sort of like journey through a very complicated story where you have this version. It's, called, it's my baby. It's not my baby. Is it, it you know, where is reality and non-reality? Whose baby is whose? What's Mr. Sinister's role in all this? And the complexity of this, I think, is done as well as it could for one episode. But as I said, this would have lent itself to be at least a part one, part two kind of thing, which I'm a little frustrated because that's exactly what episodes four and five are. So it's like, well, they are doing that. They don't have a problem. I thought, well, maybe they're trying to stay away from that formula or that sort of structure. That's not the case. So this really, I think, it's just so jumbled together. I don't know how kids are remotely going to gravitate towards the show at this point because it's just it's so complicated and it's just jumping around and not not that they don't set it up they set it up in the last episode it's jumping around with like a tone and a feel and you're not ever bonded to any characters and by the way poor wolverine he still has no nothing significant to say or do of anything we'll get to him in just a brief moment but this is all just experimental stuff from beast we get into the, basically the conversation before we have a little bit of more, oh, you know, I'm Mr. Sinister and I'm really behind everything. Now, I will admit this is a good chance to get Mr. Sinister as a household name, get him more on the tongues and in the minds of regular fans so they can bring him in to the X-Men universe and the MCU and those kinds of things when they want to get there. Because it's been rumored this whole time, like it was sort of set up at the end of the last Fox movie. There's like illusions that we're going to get some Mr. Sinister. So that part makes sense. Uh, I don't know that this makes you that sells you action figures or makes people want to run out and grab those comics, but in theory, that's what it should be doing. And you basically just end up with a lot of this sort of stuff, this surreal stuff with all these different characters. Um, you know, you get sulky gambit, not really finding a place morph. Who's like joking, all that. And then you have these weird flashback hallucinations as all of what's happening here. Now I will say there's one part here. I want to touch on briefly. So there's this little sequence right here where they're they're having all this hallucination type stuff, whatever, the stuff that's manifesting. And you have Cyclops partnering with Bishop in this attack sequence. So Bishop jumps in and he's talking to Cy Cyclops 
and I've never seen this in the comics. I'm not sure this is a thing. He uses his optic blast to power Bishop up. So Bishop now levels up and he then has the ability to just, you know, manifest the optic blast into his little restructuring of his energy, which is his mutant power. But I don't think, I didn't think that it would ever, um, lend itself to, uh, not hurting bishop like i think the, the fact that bishop could do this again goes back to one of my complaints in episode one and two was that they seem like they're sneaking in new powers and changes so in morph's case and someone in the comments said no morph could always do this is that he would actually take on the ability so that's why he was able to become archangel and fly or whatever i thought it was more like imitation it was more like mystique morph doesn't really have a presence in uncanny or x-men during my heyday when i was reading it regularly morph was created for the show he dies on the show of course there's that reincarnation now we have this new version i am not up to speed on all this new stuff fair enough so this is another one of those moments that kind of caught me off guard i wasn't a fan of i like the fact that the optic blast the optic blast bishop is able to do different things but this wasn't one this this, this again it feels very much like mcu avengers contrive stuff where oh we could just do this there's no concept of well if they could have done this and why in uncanny x-men blah 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 did they not do that or why in this x-men miniseries did they not do that so they don't care we're only halfway through the episode basically before you sort of get to she calls herself the goblin queen this is the future madeline Pryor. so there's the clone version that's kidnapping nathan from mr sinister and that's what happened now i want to say this the art is clearly digital and doesn't have some of the texture and some of the things that made the original show really good. However, the original show gets worse and worse as it goes on. It's done really well for what it is. Like, it seems like I feel like I'm still in the animated X-Men universe. I like the animation. I think some of this was done great. Um, and then we'll get to kind of what's next. Because then you end up with like the worst elements of the show. It's like Rogue, Magneto, and the fact that they don't ever use Wolverine. And you have sort of like, we're going to go to battle and they leave Wolverine at home. So we're going to head into battle. Magneto's big plan is leave Wolverine behind. But, okay. So we'll get to why in a moment. So Magneto has his plan. Here's the scene, the setup with uh, Nathan going into the little ooze and being experimented on. And everybody shows up and it's a big battle. And I will say that the battle and the, and the sequence to get to Magneto was pretty good. But what's important is we need to get to this. So the only reason to have Wolverine stay behind is to have this little sappy moment like, hey, Gene, remember me? It's Logan. I'm still in love with you. It's like, okay, she's married and she's got a kid now. So number one, it still feels weird. Like it, it always bothered me a little bit that Logan doesn't move on. He's so obsessed. Two, it really isn't content that fits the X-Men animated universe that they want to create. Like this is supposed to be a bridge to get kids more interested in the X-Men, grow your franchise and the sort of like alternate version of the X-Men, those kinds of things. We're not even remotely getting anybody interested in Wolverine. What little boy is watching this sequence going, my gosh, I love Wolverine. He's my favorite character. It's like zero. The voice felt wrong in this episode. Now I know people have complained about the voice. It's the same actor. I believe he's just older. This just felt wrong. I don't know it, how to put my finger on it beyond that. Just everything about it just didn't work for me. So we cut back over and we end up with like, you know, Jean's flashback. You can see her in the background here. So you have Goblin Goblin Queen and the real Jean uh, communicating what it was like when they first met Xavier. And this is their version of Xavier. Man, is he effeminate, effeminately drawn. Like, wow, that's just not, not Professor X, but okay. Uh, this is their battle sequence. They kind of play through. I did. This was a cool like fan service moment. Totally get that. I don't know how people feel about this. I feel like this is just one of these things where I've lost my love and my faith in the creators because I don't think they're fans like we are. So yes, yes, you can nod to the original X Men team on the left, and yes, you can look at the death of a Phoenix, the Dark Phoenix saga on the right. But you do you feel like that's done out of love? Like, oh my gosh, this is such a great opportunity to bring all this stuff to new fans. I don't get that sense. And instead we get Gene thinks about the baby. We got to save the baby. And you have this big battle. And then you have actual Nathan. Now, this is probably 
the only thing that comes out of it that's really good is they set up Nathan as a backstory for Cable, and they really do this. Oh, they got to send him into the future, that kind of thing to cure him, whatever. I just feel like we're missing a bunch of steps. <laughs> Again, I go to we are sure are cramming. I mean, we're not talking about like one issue or two issues of comics. We're about dozens of issues of comic books into a 30 minute kid show. It is, it is, it's just too much story being crammed in and you end up with just sort of like a shell of what it actually is. So that's kind of where we leave things off. It's like, can we save Nathan? What we're going to do? And then it's like, you know, the whole, we wipe the memory and send him to the future with Bishop to save him. And then you have Madeline Pryor saying God about a gene and Cyclops not knowing what to think. Cyclops doesn't know what he's been, who he's been sleeping with. He's been sleeping with the clone or the real gene or what's going on and who's who and what's what. And I feel <laughs> that we can't just have fun. These are creators that want to have commentary and social arguments and get deeper. And I don't disagree that the original material did some of that, but the show stayed a little higher so the kids could be a gateway, an entry point for them. And then they can get deeper as we get lately explore more comic books and deeper things like that. I feel like they're just skipping those steps and they're coming in way too much too fast. So with all that said, I'm going to go on to episode four. And five. I didn't want to do an episode four until there was like, you know, we had the whole story so I can do it all at once. But I'm just this episode sort of like took the wind out of my sails and made me very mad about continuing. I want to watch it a second time. Give it a I want to say give it another shot, but kind of was I being was my initial response just emotional or was I really being critical? And I just kind of feel this way. I just feel like they just try to do too much in the episode. It's too convoluted. Episode one and two are fine. Like I said, this whole new power thing, Gambit energizing Wolverine, Morph taking on the powers with the physical representation of the person he's he's mimicking and then of course the cyclops bishop thing are the three that come to my mind but of course we've put wolverine on a shelf we really put gambit on a shelf gambit's really not done anything significant so we had a sentinel battle it was cool we have moments and then we just run away from those moments so cyclops has been cool he's probably the best character he's been developed really well in this uh, first three episodes i don't exactly get all of sort of like the relationshipy soap opera stuff for kids, but I don't hate it. It's just, I don't, I feel like it's a show that's drifting away from its identity. What are you trying to do? What is the point of the show? And this is where the show seems a little misguided to me, but that's my take on it. Love to hear from you guys. Thanks for watching. I am Pops. The most popular comic book in the world today is coming to life. Don't miss the premiere of X-Men Saturday, October 24th on Fox. Now McDonald's has food with funny faces. <laughs> Hello. Four Happy Meal guys with stickers. French fries. You get one Fisher Price food toy with each Happy Meal you buy. Bedtime at Snagit Buddies. Fisher Price fun with food Happy Meal at McDonald's. It's alive. It's jello. It's squishy. It's fruity. It wiggles as it slides down your throat. Mm. Eat it before it eats you. J E L L O. Get this! At school I found this magic lamp, and I wished for Disney's Aladdin for my Sega Genesis. It's like the movie! I got to battle sword flashing thieves, and nasty palace guards, and ride a flying carpet. And I still have two more wishes! Prove it! <laughs> Sega Genesis and Disney's Aladdin game cartridge, each sold separately.